Um, so hi everyone, welcome to another week of IT Forum. And today we have with us Eduardo, who is a postdoc at USC, and he's going to be telling us about more about 3D point cloud, compression of 3D point cloud attributes, and specifically using uh, graph-based methods. So over to you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, so yeah, so I'll be I'll be talking about uh, our recent work on uh, point cloud attribute compression. Uh, this this work has been done with several collaborators. So mainly the Antonio Ortega's uh, group at USC uh, and then other collaborators also at Google, University of Brasilia and University of Brussels. And also recently we've been working with uh, KDDI research. Uh, from Japan. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, several papers that we've been uh, working on on this topic. So I'll, I'll start with a, uh, a short motivation about why what are point clouds basically and why it's it's important and interesting uh, to do compression of them. Then I'll go over some transforms uh, for 3D point clouds. The, then I'll, I'll, I'll introduce a, a new transform that we propose that's called the user graph, uh, graph uh, final processing. And then I'll talk a little bit about intra prediction or spatial prediction for this transform. And then I'll end with some experiments and some uh, remarks. So uh, a point cloud is basically, uh, it consists of two things. Uh, one of them is a list of points uh, in 3D space. Uh, and these points are represented by their X, Y, Z coordinates. And you can use uh, this list of points to represent pretty much any shape or geometry on 3D. Uh, each of these points also may have attributes, and these attributes could be color, for example, uh, transparency, or some material properties in other cases. Uh, in this talk, I'll, I'll only consider color attributes, uh, and we're going to be talking about compression of color attributes given the geometry. So the geometry also must be compressed, but in this talk, we will assume the geometry is available, and I will only talk about compression of uh, color attributes. Uh, so in, in, in the recent years, uh, basically what's happened is that technology has evolved so that you can capture 3D content uh, in real time and also high resolution, right? So we, we, we are expecting that uh, there will be a lot of uh, virtual reality and mixed reality uh, applications to entertainment and sports uh, and so on, uh, because you can capture this data sort of at, at, a, at a high rate. So that, that's one reason for compression. Uh, another reason is that now it's also available uh, at low cost. So you can, this is for example, me uh, basically capturing a, a 3D point cloud of my dog uh, using my phone. So now it's, it's kind of relatively lower cost uh, to uh, acquire uh, 3D data. So then we may see that in the next few years, there will be a lot of uh, sort of user generated 3D content that's being shared over the internet. So that's another reason for, for compression. And uh, unlike sort of more uh, computer graphics content that, for example, uh, for video games or computer generated uh, 3D objects, uh, in this case, the, the signal, uh, the color signal is very different. It's, it's more related to uh, so natural images. So, so the techniques for compression of this type of data are more similar to traditional video and image coding techniques. Okay, so uh, MPEG uh, has uh, already standardized uh, point cloud compression. So they basically have two, uh, they have two uh, approaches for, for point cloud compression. One of them is uh, called video-based uh, VPCC. Uh, and it's, it's intended for uh, dense data. And what it does is basically takes uh, the 3D point cloud, and then it computes two projections, one for the geometry coordinates and one for the color. And then you can run this through a video codec. And you, of, of course, because video to codec technology is very mature, you can get a very good compression performance. And this is viewed as a short-term solution and because it reuses existing technology. Uh, so MPEG has also considered uh, a geometry-based uh, point cloud compression or GPCC. Uh, and this is a, these are a family of techniques that are, uh, perform the compression directly in three dimensions. And this is viewed as a more of a long-term solution for this type of dense point clouds that I, I showed you in previous slides. But it's, it has also applied 
to uh, a sparse point clouds, for example, LiDAR data. So I'll be talking mainly about geometry, uh, point cloud compression approaches. So I had one question on the uh, the VPC, the video PCC one. Yes. That, I mean, is the one projection enough? I mean, I mean, I think that you probably need multiple projections for the geometry to get a correct scene. Isn't that right? Yeah. I mean, it's not from one view. It's like I mean, if in these pictures, maybe you can see that it actually. So, so that, that that's where the the all the all the thinking is going into that area. It's like you you don't project from one image. You do multiple projections, and then you find a way to map three D to two D, and then back and forth basically. So it goes, but yeah, it's not one projection. It, it, but it has some issues, right? There might be occlusions, uh, but it's a, it, it's a pretty good solution uh, so far. Like it, it it works well, and a lot of people are working on how to do it in the projection. Basically, that's the the main challenge for that one. Uh, and yeah, the geometry based ones don't do projection and they just work directly on 3D. Thanks. Okay. So I can I also follow up with a quick question. So in VPCC, when you say geometric projection, so you are you also compressing the geometry? Like you can have different angles at which you are projecting. Yeah, yeah. So so if you see in this image, for example, here you are projecting the image on the left is uh, a projection of the geometry coordinates onto an image. So this green shades here, mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a way of projecting a 3D, just the geometry aspect into uh, an image. And then the other one just projects the color. So you can encode both the geometry as, as a video and the color as a video. Okay. Of course, this is a lossy compression. It does, you, you might lose something by doing this projection. But Okay, so, but, but we're gonna be, I'm gonna be talking about the 3D without projection, the, the, the case in three dimensions without uh, this type of projection. So uh, I'll, I'll start a little bit with, uh, with some lessons from video coding or what, what we know from video coding that works well, but why that is not necessarily the best thing to do for point clouds. So in, Video coding, basically the main tool that people use is uh, prediction or predictive coding, uh, which is basically just techniques to exploit correlation. Uh, so let's say you want to code in this frame, you want to code that uh, red block here, and we call this target uh, signal X. And let's say you have a, a, a group of previously coded pixels on this frame. So these are pixels that have already been compressed and they are in this uh, blue region. And then the way a predictive video coding works is that using this, this pre previously coded pixels, you build a, a predictor for the target signal X. Uh, and then in this case, for example, you may use pixels above the, the block. And if this spatial predictor is good, then you can you have this uh, residual uh, that's, that's probably very small, and then you can transform code this residual. And then a typical system would do DCT, for example, as a transform, then you do quantization, and then you do entropy coder. Okay. Uh, another typical technique is intercoding or temporal prediction. Uh, again, the same idea. You you want to uh, encode, uh, say, this block, this red block here, and then you can use instead uh, pixels from a previously coded frame at a previous time. You may use uh, pixels from this uh, blue region here. And then again, you find a predictor, and then you encode the residual. And again, if the residual is it's a good predictor, then you, you have hope that the compression will be very efficient. And then of course, video codecs can choose between temporal or spatial prediction. Now, if you wanted to do this for point clouds, there's, uh, it, it, it's actually very, very different. So let's say in an image on the left, you, you take two uh, blocks that have the same area. What happens that both blocks will have the same number of pixels and also they will both have the same underlying geometry or the pixels will be organized in the same way in this regular two degree. Well, if you do this for a point cloud, for each uh, block, even though the blocks may can have the same volume, you will have different numbers of points and both, both blocks will have different geometries. So the, the, point, uh, the color attributes will be organized differently depending on the geometry of the block. So this has several consequences. One consequence is, is for transforms. So for images, because of this regular geometry, 
you can actually use the same transform for all the blocks, uh, for example, the DCT or DST or ADST. Uh, these transforms have fast algorithms, and you can also make them even faster by exploiting separable implementation. So in general, for images, block transforms are very efficient. Uh, while for point clouds, because each block is different, you need to compute a different transform for each block. Uh, the transforms are usually not closed form expressions. You need to use eigen decomposition to obtain them, which is complex. And also these transforms don't have fast algorithms. So you need to do matrix vector products. And at the same time, there's no separable structure. So in general, block transforms for point clouds are only efficient you know, in terms of computational complexity if the blocks are very small, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a big issue here. Um, the other, the other uh, problem with the, that, that point clouds have is that the regular geometry makes the prediction very difficult. So here I have two examples where I wanna predict this uh, red blocks. For example, here you have this, wanna predict pixels in this red block for coding. And on the right, you also may wanna predict these different blocks. And then if you want to use in the, in the left example, uh, uh, spatial prediction, uh, or if you wanna do temporal prediction on the right example, you need to be able to match the geometries because different groups of points have different geometries. Uh, to be able to build a predictor, you need to be able to match different geometries. And then, at, and then after that, you need to match the color signal. So the, the way to do this is uh, using what's called point registration techniques, which solve uh, non-convex problems. And they're basically very sort of uh, iterative algorithms that can get stuck in local minima and have lots of problems. So though this can be done, but it's, it's very challenging and it has some high com very high complexity, okay? So what I'm basically saying is that we shouldn't do this, uh, this type of prediction. Uh, and then what I'm gonna be talking about is uh, a little bit about basically transforms and prediction for point clouds and what, uh, and how things are very different than what, what people have been doing for video. So first I'll, I'll, I'll introduce some uh, transforms for point cloud attributes uh, that people have proposed. Uh, one of them is called, I call it block graph Fourier transform. Another one is the region adaptive hard transform. And then I'm gonna introduce our, our proposed uh, uh, region adaptive GFT. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about prediction combined with this transform and a method for prediction that does not require uh, matching geometry, okay? So. So I have one question on this. Yes. In case of video, I mean, the geometry does change, but like if the, your frame rate is quite high, I mean, if you are looking at neighboring frames, for example, then you can approximate the geometry change using a translation or a simple, a bit of a rotation. And that's yes. what we used to like have an easier prediction. I was wondering, but isn't that also true in the three D case? Like, couldn't if the motion, if your sampling rate is reasonably high, couldn't you predict these blocks from the same similar blocks in the previous frame, like reasonably well? Yeah, but, yeah, no, you you can you can do it. <laughs> Actually, I I'm not gonna talk about it now, but I have a next next month I'm presenting a paper at PCS in San Jose, so <laughs> about that. But yeah, because the frame rate, if the frame rate is high, it's it's not as hard to predict to do temporal prediction. But you still need to do some form of geometry matching uh, because okay. the, the the number of points from frame to frame will change, and then the organis the local or sort of uh, organization of points will change too. So yeah, it, it is possible because of high frame rates, but you still need to have uh, sort of geometry matching to the to the equation. While in in, in video, you can just uh, sort of uh, so sort of superpose to yeah. the two degrees on top of each other and you don't need to match the geometries. So yeah, it, it is possible that I don't know good performance, but it, it needs some work. Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, talk a little bit about the, the graph signal processing techniques for uh, for compression that exists out there. So uh, first let's say, let's introduce uh, a graph. So a graph, it's a set of nodes. Here are they represented by uh, yellow circles. Uh, the edges of the graph are connections between these nodes represented by these color lines and edge weights represent the strength between these, uh, the, the connections, okay? And uh, I'll consider just undirected graphs. Basically the, the matrix of weights is symmetric and 
a graph signal is a function on the nodes of the graph. Here is represented by this uh, blue arrow. So for, for, for this point cloud case, the graph signal basically will be the color signal and the graph will be built on top of the geometry. Uh, one, one essential technique for, for, uh, for, for uh, graph signal processing is the, what is called the graph Fourier transform. So to, to define it, I'll, I'll mention what first the, the degree of a node uh, called the I here is the sum of all the weights of its neighbor. So for this, for this picture on the right, the degree of this node I, uh, node one, uh, is the sum of the, these weights. So basically it's uh, W12 plus W14. And the degree matrix is a diagonal matrix that has the degrees on this diagonal. Uh, and then using this, we can define the combinatorial graph Laplacian L equals the degree matrix minus the W, which is the weight matrix. Uh, and then the graph Fourier transform uh, is basically the eigenvectors of the Laplacian, uh, this matrix phi. And this is a orthonormal basis. And what I want you to remember is that the first uh, eigenvector, uh, it's which is called the DC vector is a constant. And because it uh, has unit norm, it's normalized by the, num the square root of the number of uh, points or the number of nodes in the graph. Okay, so this is the DC low frequency, lo lowest frequency vector. Um, now the, the GFT has, uh, was used first for compression of point cloud attributes in, back in 2014. So the, the, the approach that these people propose is basically to take a point cloud you partition it into equal volume blocks. And then for each block, you build a graph using the distance between the points and build using these weights, one over the distance. And this is an example on the right where you have this block with this color signal and then you build the graph as shown in the picture. Then you compute the eigenvectors of the Laplacian of this graph. You can apply the, the graph Fourier transform to the color attributes. Here on the right, you can see the, that there is one very high magnitude low pass coefficient or the C coefficient and several small magnitude high pass or high frequency coefficient here, all these coefficients. So then when you quantize an entropy code this, uh, basically all these high pass coefficients go to zero or close to zero, and then you can get a very uh, compact uh, representation, right? So you can do this for all the blocks and then you quantize an entropy code everything and you get a very efficient uh, representation. Uh, the issue with this is that to a obtain a question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, in the previous slide, so uh, when you say geometric distance, so you are basically just taking block, like how exactly are you building the graph? Like, so if you have blocks, you are just so, so finding for the this, X and Y distances and the distances between the point coordinates. Yeah. So, so this okay. is the block, right? This. Uh, what this, is bi here in your wi? Oh, the point coordinates x y c, oh, x y c okay. of point i, x y c of point j. Yeah. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah. So this is a block. Each block has a point in three D, and then you just compute distances, and those are the weights of the graph, one over distance. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, and then uh, okay. So the, the issue with this approach, even though it's it, it actually works really well, but the problem is that if you want to have good coding performance, you require very large blocks. And there are several papers that have sort of implemented variations of this idea using different types of graph constructions or uh, and transforms. But what's common to all of them is that basically, if you want good performance, you require large blocks, but also because of the complexity issues, the, it, it takes a long time to, to run this type of collect. So for example, if you wanna compute the transform, you need to do eigen decomposition, which has sort of P cube complexity. And then if you wanna apply the transform, you have P squared complexity and where P is the number of points in the block. So, so basically complexity, uh, high complexity means high performance. So that, there's, a, there's an issue there because you cannot really uh, implement these systems. For example, if you wanna do real time compression, right? So there's another approach that is like the complete opposite. That's called the regional adaptive hard transform. That is not as good. Uh, yeah. I'm not familiar with the graph Fourier transform. So I was just wondering what is the intuition on why applying the graph transform to these colors leads to like this DC component and sparse, I mean, or high components. Is that yeah, is yeah. so easy intuition for that? Because there is, yeah, yeah, no, go ahead, continue. 
Well, I mean, mainly because you are computing the transform of some other, I mean, the weight matrix has no connection with the colors. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so I was just wondering about that. Yeah. So, if so I mean, one, one intuition is that if you have, uh, like I say, like a two degree, for example, like in this previous, uh, let's say if you have, uh, like here. So you have this in the left, you have this line graph, or this path, and you build a graph like the way I mentioned before. And you compute the eigenvectors, you get the DCT, right? So, so for simple graphs, like for line graphs or for 2D grids, you get well-known transforms. Uh, there, there, there's a lot of more, theor there's a, a lot of more reasons for why this is a good idea. One of them is that when you simplify the graph uh, to line graphs or 2D grids, you, you end up with well-known transforms. For example, that, that's one reason. I see. And um, yeah. Um, okay, so let me go back. Okay, so the, let me just talk a little bit about this other approach that's called the regional adaptive hard transform. This is actually been, uh, in, it's part of the MPEG codec. And it's like a, the complete opposite of the, of the GFT. It's, it's very, has very low complexity. The performance is not as good, but it's, it's it, the complexity is so good that it, it, it's very, very popular. So the, the way this work is as follows. So you can represent pretty much any uh, 3D geometry like this bunny on the right, uh, using this thing called the OG3 decomposition. And the way it works is you basically start with a big bounding box in 3D. You can partition it along each axis. And then you check each of the sub sub cubes, and then you check if they're occupied or not. If they're occupied, you can mark it as occupied. And then you can represent each of these uh, eight by uh, two by two by two cube with, uh, with eight bits, where one represents occupied and zero represents empty. And then you can just recursively do this process for each of the cubes. And then you can mark occupied or unoccupied. And you can represent this, this process uh, as an oak tree here, or basically a tree where each, uh, each node has at most eight children, right? And then you basically hear each uh, blue circle represents an occupied, uh, an occupied block, right? And this, this example here represents the geometry of this, uh, of this uh, cube, of this set of blue cubes on the left. So for a 3D point cloud, you can, you can imagine that you can do this for, uh, with an oak tree that has many levels. And then in the terminal nodes, you can place all the color attributes in the terminal nodes. Right, because the terminal nodes will represent each point for a large 3D point cloud. Okay. Uh, and the way this transform works is basically it computes the full oak tree, organize the points uh, in the terminal nodes of the oak tree. And then let's say you have, you have here three occupied three points with three attributes, let's say blue attribute, yellow attribute, and yellow attribute. And then this can be represented by a, a cube uh, with eight, uh, small subcubes here, right? And what this transform does is it takes this cube and, and it does processing along X, Y, and Z direction. So let's say you start uh, with the yellow and red because they're neighbors along the X axis. Uh, you can apply a two by two orthogonal transform uh, that combines this uh, yellow uh, and red voxels. For example, here you have on the right, you have the yellow and red attributes. You apply this two by two transform, and then you get a green uh, low pass coefficient and a green high pass coefficient here. Uh, and then you can squeeze along the x-axis, and then this is shown in this picture here. Uh, now you can, uh, and then uh, let, let me mention something about this Q value. So these Q values represent the importance of each point. So some points are more important than others. And you, you will see maybe in the next couple of slides why that is the case, but this is like the, sort of the, general, the general way of doing this. And so this Q is QI and QR, or sorry, QY and QR are the importances of uh, points uh, I and R. So let's say once you do this two by two orthogonal transform, you can do it in the Y axis now, but because the green, block and the blue block don't have neighbors in that direction. You just squeeze it along that vertical direction and you get, you end up with this. And now you can do the two by the process along the C direction. 
And here the two by two transform will consider the importance of the green point and the importance of the blue point. And it will take as input the green and blue attributes, and then it will produce a low pass coefficient and a high pass coefficient. Okay. And then the importance here, maybe a key equation is the importance of the green attribute is the sum of the importances of the yellow and red, which are the computed in the previous step. Uh, and then this, this produces this uh, a purple attribute. And what you do is uh, this purple uh, low pass coefficient here. And what you do is basically you have one low pass coefficient now and two high pass coefficients. Uh, and then you promote this low pass coefficient to a lower uh, resolution level on the oak tree. Then you can do this for another block. You can do this for another block. And then you can group all these sort of low pass coefficients at this lower resolution and process it again and move it up to another lower resolution level. So, so this is a, a technique that takes pairs of points, applies a 2D transform that to do decorrelation, and then sort of groups them in some way uh, recursively. It's like a hard transform, but on 3D. Uh, and this is, as, as you can imagine, because it, it has, uh, it composes these very small transforms, it, it can be implemented very efficiently. Like the complexity is very low. Uh, now the, and an issue with this transform is that it doesn't really exploit the spatial correlation of the signal, right? Because it only processes two points at a time. So, so what we came up with is a, an idea that combines both ideas, both the, the tree structure uh, uh, sort of composition of transforms with the block GFT that explodes the, the, the geometry much better. And we propose this thing called the regional adaptive graph Fourier transform. So what we do is we take uh, several small transforms and we uh, sort of compose them in using this tree structure. So let's say you start with a full resolution point cloud on the left, you can do block GFT uh, and you can partition and do block GFT. And then you can propagate the low pass coefficients to a lower resolution point cloud that can be obtained by downsampling. And then you can do this multiple times. You do partition, block GFT, downsample, you propagate coefficients and you do it again and again and again. And if the blocks are small enough, and then you can get sort of n log n complexity, which is the same as the rat. Uh, and both the, the rat and the block GFT are, can be seen as special cases of this idea. I'll, I'll, I'll explain in more detail how, how this works in the next few slides. Uh, so first, let's say you have a point cloud at high resolution. Uh, here, you partition it into blocks. Uh, here I represent each rectangle as a different block and these rectangles have different sizes because they have different numbers of points. Uh, so for each of these blocks, you apply a, a, a block G or a graph Fourier transform. And for each block, you will basically obtain a group of high pass coefficients represented by these blue colors and one DC coefficient. Okay, and you do this for all blocks. And then you can sort of reorganize uh, and group all the low pass coefficients on one side all high pass coefficients on the other side. And then you can put these low pass coefficients into a lower resolution point cloud. You do another block partitioning and then you can repeat this process multiple times, right? You can just repeat over and over again. Uh, you can view this algorithm uh, as, a, as a tree. Also like, like what I, I did with the rat, for example, you have a three level tree. Uh, the leaves of the tree, V1 to V9, represent the full resolution attributes of the point cloud. Internal nodes represent the intermediate resolutions and the root represents the lowest resolution. And the algorithm will work from the leaves to the root. And then here you group, for example, in the first block, you will group three, three attributes. We'll have one low pass coefficient and then two high pass coefficients. Then you do the same for the second block and for the third block. And as you can see, it's very similar to the wrap, but now you're allowed to combine uh, more, more points. And then this, this basically exploits the correlations a little bit better. Um, and then you pass this low pass coefficients represented here by squares. You can process them together and then you pass them to a lower resolution and so on, right? Uh, so I, I described the general idea of the algorithm, but 
for this to actually work well, you need to uh, incorporate the, the irregularity in the geometry. So, so for example, in this case here, uh, let's say we, we, we will do this, uh, this one level uh, array GFT for this signal. So here consider uh, this uh, patch of an image, which has like a constant attribute. So the color is the same everywhere. And then you partition it into three blocks. Uh, these three blocks have the same size. So it's represented here by three green rectangles that have the same size. The number of points is P1. So when you compute the, the DC coefficient, you, you do inner product with this signal here, the constant signal normalized by the square root of P1. So if you do this the inner product of the signal with the all one signal here, you obtain three low pass coefficients that are the value is square root of P1. So basically you map a, a constant signal to another constant signal. Now, if we consider this example of a point cloud where well, the signal might be constant or approximately constant, but when you do the partition, the three blocks have different sizes. So you will have three rectangles here of different sizes. And then for each, for each of these blocks, you will have to use a different uh, Fourier basis. So even though all of them are gonna be constant because of their orthogonality, the normalization is gonna be different. So it's gonna be PI, where PI is the number of points on that block. So when you do this inner product, you're going to map this constant signal to a non-constant signal, right? That's gonna have three different values because of the different number of points of each block, right? So then if you do this for, let's say for a big point cloud, here I take a, a piece of a point cloud and, and apply this block G, one level block GFT, and then I propagate the low pass coefficients to the lower resolution point cloud. And you see that it maps a constant signal in high resolution to a non-constant signal in low resolution. Right. So then if you wanted to do this again, you're going to have a lot of uh, energy leakage in the high frequency. And uh, this is because the basically the, the geometry is very irregular, right? So this would not happen if you did this technique for an image, for example. So the, the way we, we solve this is like we, we, we don't use the, the graph Fourier transform as is. We, we propose a new graph Fourier transform. So we, we start by taking this uh, Q matrix, which has the, the number of points of each block in the diagonal. And then we define this thing called the Q normalized Laplacian, which just takes the standard Laplacian matrix, but normalizes it on left and right by Q to the minus one half. So now this, the normalized Laplacian has both the spatial relationships of the, of the points, and also it has the relative importances on it. And we, instead of using the GFT, we use the QGFT. Uh, and uh, an important feature of this QGFT is that the first eigenvector is now, is not a constant, but it's proportional to the number of points of each block, or the square root of the number of points of each block. And then when you, when you basically do the inner plug or the transform with, the, with this, uh, with this uh, non-constant non DC signal here, you basically don't have any high frequency leakage. All the high frequency coefficients are zero. So this basically has the, the behavior that we would expect because it, it looks at this signal as a constant, okay? Now, the way we, we do this is like, we will have a different uh, Q matrix for each block at this resolution, right? And the way we, we compute these matrices is recursively. So let's say at the highest resolution, all points have the same importance equal to one. Then when we, when we do the block GFT and we propagate the low pass coefficient to the, to the, the parent node, uh, the importance of this, of this coefficient now is gonna be three, which is the sum of the importances of all these children. Here we do the same for this other block and then the importance will be four, which is the sum. And then here the importance of this low pass coefficient is gonna be two. And then when we process this, uh, these three low pass coefficients together, we're gonna use the normalized, the QGFT with, this, with the importances three, four, and two. And then we propagate it to a lower resolution level and the importance of this, uh, of this point now is going to be nine, which is the sum of three plus four plus three. So this, is, this way we, we, get, uh, we avoid this energy leakage because of the irregularity of the geometry.
uh, I'll, I'll show you some, some of the experiments uh, of this uh, transform without prediction. So just uh, the transforms. Uh, I, I consider uh, this data set called the AI data set, which is a high, high resolution dynamic point cloud data. And we encode the colors in the YUV domain. Um, we compared three transforms, the RAT, uh, the block GFT, and this array GFT. Uh, we, we use uniform quantization and then run, run length golem rise uh, for entropy coding. Um, uh, here I, I show you an example of um, one of the sequences of this data set. So first uh, for the block GFT, we consider different block sizes. The same for the array GFT, we consider different block sizes. Uh, so maybe the, the first uh, thing I wanna point out is that the rat here represented by this black line is the one with the smallest PSNR or the worst coding performance at all rates. But it's also the one with the best complexity, right? And then on the top, the magenta solid line is the array GFT with the best performance, and the magenta dashed line is the block GFT. So you have that, uh, and then in between, you have different array GFTs and different block GFTs with different block sizes. So we we all, we didn't uh, get what we expected here. We recovered uh, a lot of the result from the block GFT, but now we can interpolate in between. So we have versions of the array GFT that has performance similar to RAT, that have low complexity, and other versions that have performance close to the GFT with higher complexity, okay? But in general, the, the array GFT is always better than, than RAT. Uh, so here is a, some, some uh, visualizations of the decoded signals uh, at 32.1 uh, PSNR or dBs. Uh, so it, it's still like the array GFT is always better than the RAT, but they both have blocking artifacts. And this is due to uh, the blocks. The, the, the reason is because we use block transforms. So this is typical, for example, in, it looks like a lot like JPEG artifacts. Uh, so what, what we, because of this, we realized that we should be able to, uh, or a way to improve this is, and also get rid of the blog artifact is we look for ways of implementing the array GFT with small block transforms so that the complexity is not high. Uh, so what we did is we, we, we combined the array GFT with low, small block size uh, with intra-prediction. Uh, so the, the main idea here is that you can look at the array GFT as a tree structure uh, filter band where you start with a full resolution point cloud here uh, with the high resolution attributes. You apply a one level block GFT and then you get low frequency coefficients or lower resolution attributes and you obtain detailed high frequency coefficients. And then you do this multiple times, right? And then in, in the previous experiments, we would encode the approximation coefficient and detailed coefficients D0, D1, D2 at different resolutions. So this is the, the array GFT. What we realized is that uh, we can predict, we can remove redundancy a little bit better uh, if while we do the decoding. So the, the, the proposed approach is basically at this resolution, can predict the detailed coefficients from the coded low pass coefficient. So the prediction is not based on blocks, but it's uh, between coefficients at the same resolution. Uh, now I'll, I'll go over a little bit of about this in more detail. So let's say you start with the lower resolution approximation coefficient, you encode this, then you can decode it into this uh, vector a hat, a zero hat. And then at each, at, each, at each increase in resolution, you can predict the detailed coefficient from the decoded approximation coefficient. And then basically this is, we, we, we show a technique later on to build a predictor. So the predictor here is called D tilde L. Uh, and then we do a, a, a typical predictive coding strategy where we compute the difference between uh, the detailed coefficient DL and the predictor, and then we quantize it and then copy code it. And then at the decoder, we need to decode uh, this uh, to do this recursively. So basically, uh, we can at the decoder we can invert the entropy code and the quantization, and then we can recover. Uh, a decoded low pass, uh, high pass coefficient, d hat L, uh, using the 
again, the predictor and the, and the decoded residual. And then combining this decoded uh, high pass coefficient with the decoded low pass coefficient, we can obtain a decoded high low pass coefficient at a higher resolution, this a hat L plus one. And then we can repeat this process again. So we can input this to our, uh, our predictive encoder again, and then we can sort of go to do this recursively multiple times. Uh, now, the, the way we build the predictor uh, is as follows. So we start, again, we start with the decoded low pass coefficient a hat L. What we do is we zero pad it. Uh, we, have, we apply the inverse transform and we do this normalization by the coefficients. And in, in this paper, we show that this signal uh, is a piecewise constant. Uh, and then, but, but the, the interesting part is that the resolution of the geometry and the color are different. So the color is very low resolution while the geometry has higher resolution. So because of this mis mismatch in geometry and color resolution, we can add details to this picture uh, with a graph, low pass graph, graph filter. And then we get this, this, uh, this reconstructed signal here on the right that we use as a predictor. Uh, but we, because we want to predict the high pass coefficients only here, okay, what we do is we invert this system uh, from the left, we apply the inverse of the system here, and then we get uh, an approximated an approximation for the detailed coefficients that we use for prediction. Uh, as a graph filter, we use a very simple graph filter where W is the, the weight matrix. Uh, and D is the degree matrix, but this is for the whole point cloud or at this resolution at least. And the way that it, this works is, is very simple for each, for each point, uh, you compute the average uh, between the value of that, at that node and the weighted average uh, of the neighbors. And this normalization is that, so this is a convex combination. Of course, there, there are, it, it's possible to improve this filter, but this one works uh, very well. Uh, now the, the main idea behind, or the intuition behind the predictor is as follows. So let's say you start with a low resolution color signal uh, that's represented here by this uh, different color blocks. And then this uh, zero padding plus interpolation uh, block from, from a couple of slides ago, basically produce a piecewise constant signal, but on a higher resolution geometry. And then we can use, for example, we can filter this, uh, this piecewise constant signal using a graph. And then for example, for this uh, red point here, we will use the neighboring uh, cubes or the neighboring points in this high resolution. And then we'll get like a combination of gray and blue. For this point here, we do the same, but we use this high resolution neighbors. And then we get a combination of blue and yellow and we get like a, approximately a green color. And then we do this for all points, basically for this point, this point, Etc. Only using the neighbors in high resolution. This is how we build the, the predictor from a couple of slides ago. Uh, what what's different from from a, from an approach that's been implemented by MPEG is that in MPEG uh, they use the RAT, and and basically because they don't consider the high resolution uh, in the point cloud, or they they ignore basically some of the uh, geometry information, they build the predictor using the neighbors in a low resolution point cloud. Uh, so the predictors that they, they build are not as good, while our predictor here exploits the, the, high, uh, the higher resolution geometry that's available. Uh, here are some, some results of combining the, the array GFT with this intra-prediction. So I'll, I'll, I'll outline some of the main, uh, main, main curves on this plot. So this uh, orange plot is the array GFT from uh, a few slides ago with the worst performance, so the one that, that is closer to RAT. And the blue curve here is the array GFT with the best performance, uh, the one that's close to uh, the block GFT with the best performance. And all the other curves are different versions of intra predicted transforms. Uh, so maybe the the first thing I want to point out is that the intra array GFT is uh, the black line here and outperforms all the other methods at all bit rates. And it's a, uh, and what's interesting is that it only uses a two by two block transform. So it uses very small transform. So it has good complexity, but when combined with the, 
the, the proposed intra prediction method, uh, it outperforms everyone, everyone else. And the, the purple curve uh, is the RAGFT, but the predictor uses the, does ignores the high resolution geometry. So it's like the, the predictor that's used by, uh, by MPEG with the RAT. And it, here you can see clearly that by basically the, by using the high resolution geometry, we can get uh, a significant boost in performance. Uh, the green line is uh, our implementation of the intrapredicted RAT uh, that's similar to MPEG. And then here we can see that the, the performance is, uh, we, we, we achieve better performance than this, uh, this method by about half a dB in general. Uh, these results are, are consistent with uh, other sequences here, for example. Oh, Edward, a oh, quick question. Yes. Yes. I'm not sure if I'm uh, understanding this correctly. So um, if you, can you just change your predictor, for example, like the high frequency predictor um, and use it for compressing the, uh, in, in MPEG, for example, how it's done? Can you basically just change the intracoding predictor and yes. use? Uh, so the, the, the MPEG predictor, so it is based for RAT. So because RAT doesn't only combine two points at a time, it doesn't really have a higher order geometry. It's all, I don't think we could use it directly. The predictor is, works only for the array GFT, I think. But if I understand this currently, uh, correctly, like for RAT, like you are decomposing it on X, Y, and Z axis, right? But yes. you could not do that and have a two by two by two transform like a higher dimensional transform directly. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I, I think the, the way it's implemented, it couldn't be doing so. You probably need to change the way the RAD is implemented. Uh, yeah, I mean, there the, the could be a way of, of incorporating it with that, I think. Uh, okay, yeah, just, just trying to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, and I, 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 I understand. It's, I, I haven't thought about it, but, uh, yeah, it might be it might be possible. I'm not sure exactly how the RAT is implemented in MPEG. I have like my own implementation, so it might be it might be quite different. But yeah. Um, yeah thank you. <laughs> yeah. No. No problem. Okay. So yeah. So I, I think I'm I'm almost done. Um, almost done. So the yeah. So the these these results are fairly consistent and. And yeah, so so this this uh, high resolution predictor is usually like very very uh, good at, at at getting like a, a, a improving the the coding performance significantly. Uh, this is like a reconstruction result. So the one on the right uses the array GFT with large block sizes, and again you can see the here the all these blocking artifacts because of the big block sizes. Uh, and the ones in the middle are the intra ray GFT, are the intra predicted RAT uh, from MPEG. And they both have, they don't have this blocking artifact, but they both have different uh, types of uh, issues too. So, for example, the intra RAT has a little bit of over smoothing in a lot of regions. So, it loses a lot of detail in the eyes, while the, the proposed intra ray GFT has, doesn't have over smoothing, but it has some artifacts, for example, here in the eyebrows or around the mouth. And, and we think this is because the filter is uh, a little bit naive. It doesn't uh, adapt too much. And it could be, I think this, this those little artifacts could be improved by playing a little bit with the filter parameters. Um, but it, regardless of that, we, we get, at least for this case, we are at the same build rate, uh, about 0.3 dB gain with respect to the MPEG uh, system. Um, so I think I'm, I'm done with this. So uh, maybe I, as a summary, I, I just want to say that the, basically this, this, trans, this new transform has like a lot of flexibility uh, and you can basically, uh, there's a lot of choices that we made that were not optimized. So you can look at the, for example, the graph construction, the block partitioning and the way the predictors are built. Uh, and the key ideas that we, we exploited that, that are not only ours, but other papers have exploited them as well, are basically that the graphs can be very good to exploit the geometric relationships, but also you need to take into account the, the irregularity using these uh, point weights. Uh, and that is, I think, the key element in a, a lot of 
point cloud compression algorithms are, are have obtained good performances by doing that. If you don't do it, then the performance drops significantly. Uh, and another, I think another important contribution that we had is that the, the way that we do prediction does not need a geometry matching. Uh, so yeah, that, that's it. And maybe I'll, I'll announce some, some, uh, uh, some motion estimation paper we're presenting uh, for point clouds to we're presenting next month in PCS in San Jose, which is close to where you all are. And we have other extensions of this work also to fractional motion estimation and chroma subsampling that's been published in the past few months. Uh, so if you have any more questions, just uh, uh, yeah, let me know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I can thank the speaker. Thank you. Eduardo for the great talk um and yeah so we are open for questions so yeah if anyone in the audience has any questions I think at this point you can mostly unmute yourself and ask may i ask a question please yeah all right thank you eduardo thank you for the great presentation i really enjoyed it uh can you comment on how quick this would be to run i mean how many frames per second you can process does oh, it come well, anywhere close to 30, you know, like frames or anything so, that may appear yeah, yeah, to be yeah. real fast like? I, Thank you. I, I can say that my my implementations are not very efficient. Uh, I have MATLAB implementations. I'm working actually on a C implementation, uh, so I'm not sure yet. I think the rat, the rat is extremely fast. So, uh, so this one, uh, this one is very, very fast. And the version, that works very well that I showed like at the end of the of the talk. Uh, I mean, I'm working on a C implementation that I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it would be comparable to the RAT implementation. Uh, so I, I'm not sure. I know the RAT can be run in real time. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that I can run my, my own my system also in real time, but I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. That's still something I'm working on. Uh, may I ask a follow up question? Go ahead. Okay, so has uh, like MPEG, does MPEG has any results in terms of, uh, you know, uh, implementing this and running some experiments to see what kind of frame rates they can achieve? Uh, uh, I would say their, their, their codecs are available online. So for example, uh, they have- I remember, sorry yeah, yeah, to pause yeah, yeah. it there. I was going to mention, I talked to Danilo Graziosi from Sony okay. who works on this, uh, uh, standardization efforts and he mentioned that they typically cannot run in real time and uh, he was saying that but maybe he was just talking for this patch predict prediction to 2d and then using video codex to uh, compress but i'm not sure i have to revisit his emails but uh, yeah I, I think yeah no I, I know i know danilo too i think that he he might be talking about the video based ones uh, mm, okay. And I think it's because of this projection. It's very complex. I'm, I'm sure okay. like a lot of people exactly. are working on that. Yeah, I mean, well, right. you, can, you can run the video codec in real time, right? <laughs> of course. Yes, yes. But the, the projection course. aspect is not possible. So, Indeed. Yeah, in that. So for the uh, for the geometry one, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can run a version of it in real time. But the performance is not as good. That, that's okay. the problem. It's, it's still not competitive with the video-based approaches. So. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah. Uh, as, uh, not, Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. I apologize. Please. I hope I oh. didn't uh, cut out your your thought. Yeah. No. That that that's it. That's it. I don't have anything else. To I, I was be curious to like hear you know see like uh, what would the frame rates for this approach and I can mention that as an alternative with like a team of uh, students we have pursued uh, using machine learning techniques to actually downsample the cloud and just send you know like a lower resolution. Uh, cloud, you know, to the destination and then just upsample it there. And, uh, you know, the, we have devised some uh, interesting techniques that help us like run this in linear complexity so that in, we can actually achieve like 30 frames per second upsampling rate. Okay, um, how much How much is the upsampling? How much, like how? We can downsample even 10x and even more, you know, like. Uh, oh, wow. Um, yeah, I can share like uh, if you want the, uh, archive uh, version yeah, of the paper please share, here share in, the, in, the, in the chat box and you know feel free to contact yeah. me if you have it so please basically we were ahead. yeah we were looking at this as a way of enabling like real-time air streaming but we realized that using compression based techniques may be very slow for us and so this is what we try to do as an alternative where you yeah. down sample the high resolution you send yeah. it to the client and then up sample it using 
uh, deep learning techniques. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, we, we, uh, we consider uh, maybe no, a non-deep learning version of that based on, so we have this work on chroma downsampling. Okay. But we only downsample the, the chroma channels, right? Ah, so, okay, okay. But yeah, it, it, I think there, that, that's actually a very good, very good idea because otherwise it's, it's, it's really, really, really complex. Every, because of all these other issues that you have, like yes, you have exactly. extra complexity, so you need to get away you need to find a way to reduce it somehow. Yeah. So I yes, think I, yes. I actually take a look at your at your work. Yeah, take a look. And the models are actually quite small. Maybe for a three megabytes model, like for deep learning model, we can compress at very high fidelity, like for 29 milliseconds running on a GPU. And so that means we can compress at 30 frames per second with within less than a second, a little bit. Okay, thank you. What what is this? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the paper right now. Thank yes. You. Yeah, you, you can contact me. Give my best regards to your advisor, Antonio. Okay, thank you. All right, thank take you. care. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? Okay, I guess we are perfectly on time. So let's uh, thank the speaker one again. Thanks, uh, Eduardo, for the great talk. Okay, thank you for, for thank the you. invitation. Thank you.